This episode is sponsored by Libelu. of the Board Game Geek Podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I'm really, really excited to be here today with Corey Konetska, who not only designed Battlestar Galactica and Star Wars Rebellion, which are two of my favorite games and a bunch of other awesome games, but he's also the head of a game studio called Unexpected Games. How's it going today, Corey? Great. Yeah, we're super busy, but we're excited and um, having fun. Cool, cool. What's new in your world? I mean, I know, like, you've, again, designed so many different games, and now you're, like, kind of running your own publishing company. So uh, you must be busy all the time. <laughs> yes, yeah. Especially right now, we're, we're nearing the end of a, a big project, so we're in crunch time. But, um, yeah, always a thousand things going on running around, putting out fires, trying to put out awesome games. Yeah, I love it. Love it. I love playing awesome games. <laughs> so that's awesome. So what you and I just met for the first time at Gen Con, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm still, I guess, compared to several people, like newer to the board gaming hobby. And one thing I noticed like early on as I was kind of discovering all these modern board games is like there's so many games out there with like fantasy themes or like just like sci-fi themes and then like all these Euro games where you're kind of trading in the Mediterranean. And now nowadays uh, we seem to be kind of getting flooded with like a lot of animal themed games and nature themed games and food related games, which is really cool to see like people kind of just doing some different things um, and exploring different themes with board games. So for me, I find that always refreshing to kind of discover games that have more rare themes. So today we're going to discuss board games that we've played with very, very unique themes. Um, it's not necessarily our favorite board games or anything, but it's just like games that we played and were kind of intriguing that had just really unique themes. So, um, and Corey, you were, you kind of chose this topic. <laughs> yeah. So I, I take it you're you're a fan of uh, just kind of discovering unique games. Yeah, I love just weird, wacky stuff. Um, the the crazier the theme, the more interested I am immediately. Um, yeah, and it's funny you brought up the the nature theme stuff. And as I was kind of making my list, if I had been making this list like five or six years ago, <laughs> like I would have made a completely different list, right? Like yeah. when Wingspan came out, that might have been described as a game with a unique theme. Right. But now everyone's doing it. And so it's not unique anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I feel I feel the same way. Uh, but before we start talking about unique themed board games, I'd love to hear what you've been playing lately, Corey. So let's jump into Fresh Plays. Yeah, so um, the, the games I picked for this were games that I actually got to play at Gen Con this year. They're not necessarily all brand new releases out of there. But the first one was Forbidden Jungle um, oh. that did come out this year. That's a Matt Leacock design from his Forbidden series. I think it's the fourth one in there. Um, published by Game Right for two to five players. And this is a cooperative game. You are um, all like stranded in this jungle on this alien world and you need to work together to um, repair this portal so that you can escape. Um, and so if you've played any of the other Forbidden series, like uh, Forbidden Desert, Forbidden Island, you're, mm -hmm. there's definitely some similarities and things that, that you can recognize there. I feel like this one has a little bit more meat on the bones. There's a little bit, oh, cool. a, a little bit more complexity, a little bit... Um, more decisions and there's a there's an interesting slide puzzle element to it almost where you're trying to move the tiles around um and uh 
uh, yeah, I had fun. It was, we played at four players at Gen Con. It was like the last night of the show or something. And, uh, we, we managed to win, but it was close and it was interesting. <laughs> and I just like co-ops. I just like working together with people. It's that's, always a ball. That's cool. Yeah. I played, uh, I remember actually I did, I used to have Forbidden Island, I think was the first one, right? And then it was mm-hmm. Desert. But yeah, I that game was so hard to me at first. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, you know, just like eventually Pandemic was so hard to me. I mean, it's still, it's a hard game. But uh, I saw Forbidden Jungle was coming out and um, I didn't get a chance to try it yet. But I, I like the theme of it because I know, like, I forget what the previous one was. Uh, it was something Forbidden Sky or something. That sounds right. That sounds right. Something I I I don't remember exactly what it was, but uh, this one definitely seemed more appealing to me. Um, and I like that what you're saying is in terms of it being like a little meatier, um, in terms of the decisions and everything. Yeah, there were some interesting mechanics where there's like these spider aliens laying eggs that will then hatch and mature Gross. and start chasing you around. Um, no, oh, wow. it's it pretty cool. Oh, <laughs> uh, cool. Well, I re- Oh, and that was forbidden, that was forbidden jungle. jungle. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I recently played a game, a wacky and wild cooperative game called quirky circuits, penny and gizmos snow day. And this is a 2022 release uh, by Nikki Valens. And you know Nikki Valens, I'm sure, because they designed uh, Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition and Elder Tire with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is a game from Plat Hack Games for two to four players. And it is a very like silly and fun, limited communication, cooperative programming game that uh, Ryan from the Trick Talkers podcast, which is an awesome podcast uh, for anyone who's interested in trick-taking games. They mostly just talk about trick-taking games and card games. Uh, but Ryan and Patrick are both sweethearts, and they always like recommend games to me. And usually they're trick-taking games, but in this case, Ryan told Patrick and I both about Quirky Circuits, and the way he described it just made it sound like so fun. And I was like, I have to try this. I have to try it. So um, Plaid Hat Games actually um, hooked me up with a copy of it when I went to Gen Con. And it basically is a game where you have this scenario book that you're going to play through. It's it's a lighter game. Uh, so you can play it with, you know, your family and everything. And each scenario in the book has like different unique challenges. And there was another game called Quirky Circuits, I think, from either a year or two ago. So this is a new version on it. And you have two characters in this game. You have Gizmo, who is this little cat on like a Roomba vacuum. And you, whenever you play a scenario that has Gizmo, you have to move Gizmo around a room and collect all these dust bunnies. And then Penny, you have some scenarios with Penny, who's a robot that's on ski slopes, who's trying to collect different flags. And the, the different boards of like playing in the house, trying to pick up dust bunnies versus the ski slopes... That alone is pretty interesting, but the the way the game works is each player is or all the players are going to simultaneously like play these cards, these cards where you're programming the direction, the way that the robots are going to move. But we can't talk to each other at all. So we're, you know, and we basically will play cards down in a queue until there are at least five cards and then we can stop playing cards. But again, we cannot talk about our strategy. We can't talk about what's in our hand. And when you put a card down, the backs of all the cards have some information on what the card, what like how you might be directing the card. Like, for example, there's a card with a back that has an up arrow and a down arrow. So that means we're probably moving the robot Penny or Gizmo forward or backwards. But some of the cards that move forward might be two spaces forward, one space forward, three spaces forward, or like uh, one of the ski slope ones, you can like slide forward until you hit an obstacle. 
So you have some data on what your teammates might be trying to do when they're placing, moving, putting a card down to move a robot, but you don't know exactly. And sometimes you're not on the same page, which, you know, lends itself to like really kind of funny moments. But after everybody plays their cards and we're done playing cards, you reveal the cards and we do it one at a time. I don't remember if the rules tell you to do it that way. But then you see where the robot moves and you're moving it on this like grid board, which it's one of those, um, it's it's a booklet kind of a board. So every every page you turn has a different little map and has all the rules for the scenario that you're playing. But you're trying to do this all within, you have a certain amount of rounds and the round tracker is a battery. So you're like, the robot is running out of batteries. You have to kind of achieve this goal and you're working together and you can't talk to each other. And it's, it's super fun. You know, it's, it reminds me a bit of magic maze and the mind a little bit because Hmm. I played it so far twice, once with two players and then once with four players and definitely like with two players, you know, you have a little more control. You, you get a little, you get into a better rhythm of like, what one person might be doing or what kind of thing, you know, what kind of cards they might be playing. You get in that, like that headspace. But then I played with a group of four with where I was the only one who had played and it was just so wacky and it was, (laughs) but it was so fun. Like everybody enjoyed it. We are, you know, at, at some point, one of my friends was playing multiple cards. So we had like almost 10 cards on the table. And I'm like, this is not going to be good because you can <laughs> run this robot, just keep run, running them straight into the uh, into the wall. You could be turning them the wrong direction. And it's just, I don't know, it's a hoot. I've only played the first two scenarios so far, but I'm very curious to kind of uh, kind of go beyond that. And again, this is like a silly, wacky game. But if you like limited communication games, I think you might dig this because uh, I think like Kazuka is another like limited communication co-op game that uh, I enjoy. So I think I just really enjoy that mechanism of not of working together, but not being able to talk to each other because it's like it's just so satisfying when you do when things do click and it's like, oh, we did do it in the right way. And, you, you know you can kind of like make things happen. Uh, have you ever played qu- any of the Quirky Circuit games, Corey? No, I remember when the first one was announced. I'm like, oh, that sounds like it'd be a lot of fun. And then I never <laughs> got around to trying it. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. It, it does It does look really cool. Right now it's like, it's on my shelf as something doesn't take too long to play, really fast to teach. And it just, it's it's fun. It's a, it's a fun experience working together. And, you know, again, it's satisfying when things work out. And when things don't work out, it's hilarious. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it's the, the art is very kind of kitty looking and playful. So you can definitely like play it with kids, not super young, probably. But um, yeah, it's just a really lighthearted, fun game. And that is Quirky Circuits, Penny and Gizmo's Snow Day. What else have you been playing lately? Uh, the other game I put on this list was, was something else that I played at Gen Con, actually took this one home with me and it was make the difference is by oink games it was released in 2002 and designed by shintaro ono that's how you pronounce it japanese designer um it's for two to four players and this is a super light game i'm going to describe it to you in two seconds and you'll know how to play (laughs) cool basically you remember those old puzzles that say spot the difference between these two pictures yeah um it's similar to that. You've got these black and white um, drawings. Every player is given one. And so you take one off of this pad and you are with a black permanent marker. You are making differences to this art piece that the other people are going to try to find. Um, oh, interesting. And there's some rules to like how you can make these changes. Um, you can like make a line longer or you could add like a little line. Um, but they, you'll only get points if the addition that you make is at least a certain size big, it comes with this little tiny ruler. Gotcha. Um, (laughs) So the start of the round is everybody kind of gets a pad, they tear off one of the sheets, they get a marker and they make their five differences to their sheet. And then one at a time, players go around the table, they will reveal their sheet. They'll put out their sheet and they'll put out the original and you put this, um, 
piece of frosted plastic kind of over your sheet, just so that it's not obvious, like where you wrote with ink, um, gotcha. it obscures the artwork a little bit. Um, and we were just holding it in place to make sure it doesn't jostle around. And then the other players have until the sand timer expires to try to find these five differences. So everyone else crowds around the table and they start to try to spot them. And if you get one, you get some points. Um, after the sand timer expires, you flip it over one more time and they continue to go. But if they find a difference, they get less points. And the person who made the change, they also get points because it took them longer to find it. Gotcha, gotcha. And then at the end, if all five weren't found when the sand timer went through twice, any um, changes that weren't discovered, you'll get points based on the size of them with that little ruler. Like if they're a certain size, you'll get one point. If they're bigger than that, you'll get two points. If it's smaller than that, you get nothing. Um, so everyone puts their sheet in one at a time. We try to find the differences and then whoever has the most points wins. Pretty much yeah. the game. Oh yeah, that is really, really straightforward. How big is the box? Cause I know sometimes those oink games are like super small. <laughs> sure, it's a little bit bigger than a standard oink game, but it's maybe the size of like the mind or something. Okay, know, okay. Five inches by four inches or something. Gotcha, and, th and you picked that one up at Gen Con? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was at the oink games booth and I'm like, I really wanna get something from here. This one sounds so <laughs> weird. <laughs> I like weird games. I'll get this one. This cool, one. cool. That is make the difference. Cool. So speaking of weird games, I recently played, I taught some friends a trick-taking game called Savage Bowl, which is from 2023. It's from Japanese designer um, that goes by the name of Oreo. And it's published by Bereke K Games. And it's for four to five players. You need four or five players. I heard that it's best with five. I've actually only played it with five. And I think this probably would have been my third or fourth time playing it, maybe fourth time playing it. And I'm, let's just say, I'm awful at this game, but I <laughs> like it so much because I think it just like challenges my mind. Um, you know, it just challenges me. I find it very hard to do well and it makes me want to keep playing it. But it, this is a soccer themed trick taking game where you have uh, all the artwork on the cards are like like monster looking lizards and alligators or something. Mm. The art is kind of wild and lots and lots of colors. But in this game, each round you want to win exactly two tricks. So no more, no less. Two tricks the whole game. And it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> but the the cards have four suits and then there's also I think it was I think it's four suits and then there's a trump suit a special trump suit. And in the first half of each round the tricks are resolved differently than the second half. So in the first half basically the referee is kind of paying attention and looking out for roughhousing and whoever plays the strongest card of the trick uh, they will be flagged and then that player will get to uh, face down, discard a card from their hand and they won't play in the next round. They've been benched. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the player who played the second strongest card wins the trick. So, and this is for the first five tricks of the round. It works like that. So the strongest yeah. one gets benched and then won't, and will be sitting out for the next round and the second strongest one wins. Then after the first five cards or five tricks have been played, whoever just, and then it goes to just normal scoring where it's like the strongest card wins. And if you're the first player to get to two tricks, you get to take a little bonus card. Meaning if you don't bust, uh, you will get two extra points in addition to whatever the amount of points the round is gonna give you for being successful at getting two tricks. And then the second person to get two tricks will get like a one point bonus card. Of course, if you're the first person to get two tricks, you are at high risk for busting. Yeah. You know, people are going to probably try to push it in that direction so that you bust so you don't get those extra points. And it's just, <laughs> there's just a lot of hard uh, hand management with this game to make sure 
that you try to only win exactly two tricks. And for whatever whatever reason, I personally struggle with this. Like the very first time I played this game, I got zero points. We played the full <laughs> five rounds. I got zero points. I busted every round. Um, the other thing that's uh, interesting about this game is that when you bust, you're out of the round. So now I'm just sitting out. Hmm. But there's a whole trickle effect, especially as the game as the round, you know, hits closer to the end when people are running out of cards and everything, if I bust, the player to my left is often going to be leading next. And mm. they usually don't want to lead because yeah. <laughs> when you lead, you have less control, especially as people are running out of cards. And so they're likely to then bust. And it creates this trickle effect every, almost every single time, you know, when people start busting, it's like, Okay, the round's about to about to be over pretty quickly. But the other neat thing in this game is that everybody gets a chameleon card, which you can use once per round. And the chameleon card is basically lets you play a card when it's your turn to play a card into the trick. And instead of the card being the suit that you're playing, you play this chameleon card and it converts it to whatever the previously played card was. So again, if I, let's say somebody leads with a red card and I have a higher red card and I don't want to win that trick, but the person before me didn't have any red, so they just played blue or something, I could use my chameleon ability to say, oh, nope, now my my red 12 is a blue 12, so it can't win, you know, but you mm. can only do that once per round. So there's a whole thing of playing when with when to do that. And then also, again, with the way that the first half of the round works where the person who plays the strongest card gets benched that is like a really good strategic move to try to do that because then you can get rid of some of those trump cards or some of those high cards in your hand to hopefully try to like balance things out so you only win two tricks so uh <laughs> it is it's it's a challenging game like i mean those rules probably didn't sound too tricky <laughs> tricky but uh <laughs> but it's but it but it does add some mental complexity more so than a lot of uh more you know simpler trick-taking games and i would i would get i guess i would kind of call it a heavier trick-taking game because of sure. how thinky it is uh but again i last time i played i got five points <laughs> which was huge for me huge for me um and also i didn't mention but the scoring each round like so round one will be whoever successfully gets the two tricks gets one point. Then maybe round two is if you successfully do it, you get two points and then maybe it jumps up to five points or whatever. So each round, if you're successful with getting two tricks, the amount of points um, is increased and the game's going to end either at the end of a certain amount of rounds, depending on player count, or if any player gets to 10 points, it'll end immediately. Okay. It were there ever moments in the game where you were struggling to get your second trick or was it mostly just trying to avoid tricks? It's the trick avoidance that's the okay. challenge for me because I would, <laughs> you know, I tried everything. Like I was like, okay, I'm going to wait and not even, I'm just going to try to not win a trick for a while. But then it's like, uh-oh, I got one. <gasps> and now I'm leading. Uh-oh, I got another one. And then it's like, what do I do with this hand of cards where I need to lead again because I just won my second trick, but I yeah. don't want to win? Eh, it's so challenging. <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah, it almost feels like a reverse trick-taking game. You almost don't want tricks. You do want yeah. some, but you're going to get them anyways. Huh. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And there, there are a lot of these like trick avoidance games where you get negative points. So this one, it's like, no, you don't get any negative points. You just don't get points. But it, it, for me, it's always brutal, but I guess I just, I love that. Like, I love that challenge. Like one day I'm going to report back on this podcast <laughs> that I won Savage Bowl. You know, I don't, it could be 10 years from now, but <laughs> one day, one day. But yeah, that's Savage Bowl. So do you play trick-taking games? Yeah, I play less of them nowadays than I used to, but um I remember when I worked back at FFG, we used to play lunchtime games. And for a while, we got into Teach You. Um, nice. And we played. Uh, there was another one that we played, too. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, we got really into it. We were, like, keeping score. We had, like, brackets and <laughs> playoffs and all sorts of crazy stuff. It was fun. Cool. 
That's awesome. Well, shall we start talking about some unique themed games? Absolutely. And now a word from our sponsor. The Aristocats dance to the music. From childhood to adulthood in Frozen, Buzz Lightyear travels to infinity and beyond in Toy Story. Listen and create your own interpretations of Dixit cards in this new version inspired by Disney and Pixar movies. This autumn, awaken your imagination with the Disney edition of Dixit. Which card will you choose? In this game, invent, guess, and communicate with 84 cards inspired by Disney and Pixar movies. It's a way to play and introduce new players to the classical board game Dixit. From timeless classics to recent Disney and Pixar films, this Disney edition of Dixit will appeal to all generations. The Disney edition of Dixit is a standalone game, not an expansion. However, the cards are compatible with all the Dixit range, the basic game, Dixit Odyssey, Stella, and the expansions. It's a way to merge the two universes. Disney magic meets Dixit poetry. Available now. I'm excited to hear your list because, you know, just like you, I'm always excited to kind of discover new games. So I'm hoping, I'm wondering if we're going to have any crossovers (laughs) or if uh, you're just going to put some new games on my radar, but. Yeah. Either way, either way. <laughs> it was it was an interesting challenge. Like when we first proposed this idea, I was really excited about it. I'm like, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and then as I was making my list of like games that might qualify for this, I was like, oh, this is harder than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and what do we actually mean by like a unique theme, and what makes a theme unique? So some of my choices on here, including my first one, I think are a little bit off the beaten path as far as what you might think of as a unique theme. Okay, okay. Was it challenging to make the list because you thought of too many or was it because of you're trying to like just figure out what you thought was the most unique kind of game? Like what made it challenging for you? Because for me, I had had a situation too where like I, this was more challenging than I was expecting. (laughs) What I was finding was I was putting games on here, and then the more I thought about them, I'm like, oh, is that really unique? Um, there are actually <laughs> yes. a lot of games like that. And I'm like, oh, okay, scratch that one. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, ended up, I, I just ended up picking kind of things that are unique for very different reasons. Cool. All right. Well, let's, let's jump into it then. So uh, my first game was Tack. And this game was released in 2017. It's designed by James Ernest and Patrick Rothfuss. Uh, it was published by Cheap Ass Games. It's a two-player game. It's an abstract game, which at first you'd be like, how is that a unique theme? Um, but what <laughs> makes this theme unique, right? Abstract games, for the most part, don't really have a theme. <laughs> so the theme for this game is actually from a novel uh, called The Wise Man's Fear. Um, which is a sequel to my favorite book of all time, um, The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. And in this novel, they um, play this game called Tech. Um, And and as they're playing the game, there's like a lot of dialogue and political things happening. And um, they talk a lot about how they, they describe it as a beautiful game to play because it's not just about beating your opponent into submission like you want to win in the most clever way that you can um and so the the mechanics of the game are very simple but the the theme of it and the fact that it comes from this book series that i love so much um i felt like made it a unique theme that it's it's a fictional game from fictional world that they then turned into a real game um that's cool and the game itself is also really fun. I've played it um, with my brother and with a few other people. It's just for two players, and you've got a grid. Um, and the, uh, there's some unique things about the game in that you can play it on different size game boards. And so there's like an 8x8, eight eight, a 10x10, 10 10, and they sold all sorts of different versions of this game that like, here's the one that they might play at the pub, and here's the one that this famous character might have had their custom set that was really expensive. And here's one that somebody else might have had. Um, wow. 
And basically, uh, you've got a grid, let's say it's a six by six grid, and you're placing um, tokens down that are either walls or stones, or standing stones. So basically, you've got these wooden pieces, and you're either laying it flat. Um, and if you're laying it flat, that's the main way that you win the game. You're trying to make a um, line of flat stones from one side of the board to the other side of the board. It doesn't have to be a straight line. It could like zigzag sure. um, as long as they're orthogonally connected. So that's the main way you win is by placing out these ones down like that. The other way you can place your tiles, you can place it as a standing stone, which is basically a wall. You put it in a space and your opponent can't um, place tokens there. They can't move there. They can't do anything about it. Um, huh. And then there are um, rules for ways that you can actually move your stones that are already down on top of other stones. So you can cover up the opponent's ones to basically claim that space. And eventually you can move those stacks to make like giant stacks that you can then like <laughs> cascade across the board. Um, the strategy gets like really deep for such a simple game. Um, wow. So if you're just abstract games, if you like two player games like that, maybe check it out. Yeah, I it's love tough. abstract strategy games and I've never heard of that. So <laughs> that's really cool. Wait, T- when, did, when did this come out? Yeah, it's 2017. T A K. T A K. Yeah. Cool. And 2017. So so the game was introduced in a book and then somebody made a game of it. Yes. <laughs> Based yep. on that book. That's so cool. Exactly. <laughs> That's a really good pick. Okay. Uh so the first game I'm going to bring up is um a game where we are basically controlling the weather and manipulating clouds. And this is a game called Petricor. Petricor is a 2018 release designed by David Cherkop, and it's published by Mighty Boards and Ape Games. It plays with one to four players. And basically, Petricor, which I never knew <laughs> until I discovered this game, um, is defined as like that earthy smell of that's produced when rain falls on like dry mm. land or dry soil. The, that smell of rain that I think a lot of people know, I guess, is called Petricor. Um, okay. So this is an area majority game where, again, we're manipulating clouds and weather to make different fields have the right amount of weather so that they grow. And then it'll when a harvest phase is triggered, they'll score. Um, which is like based on a majority of different players' uh, water droplets being on the fields because they've rained down. Um, so Benita Kaur, um mentioned Petricor as one of her favorite area majority games on episode uh, 17, I believe, of the BGG podcast. And she got me like really excited about it. So I reached out to Mighty Boards and they sent me a copy of the base game and the collector's edition um which was super nice and i played it and i think it i love area majority and like area control games area influence all that stuff um one of my favorite mechanisms and i played this game and i really really like it it's 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 got like a lot of what we know if you know area majority scoring but kind of in a different way and with again a unique theme. So at the beginning of the game, you'll build a, uh, you'll place out these different field tiles randomly. So you have these different tiles because they all like kind of score a little bit differently. And depending on player count, like in a three player game, I think it's a three by three grid of these tiles. And some of them scoring wise are just like normal area majority. Like, you know, you get this amount of points if you're the have the most droplets. If you second most, you get this amount of points, which is a little less and a little less for third. But there's some things that are a little more interesting and clever. Like there are some fields that will have the person who's second has the second most gets the most points. Um, some of them are based on the number of players that are present on a field. So if I'm the only one with my droplets on a field and it it is growing, you know, when it's time for harvest and it scores, 
I get 12 points. But if two of us are there, we each get eight points. If three of us are there, we each get five points. So um, there's that. And then there's there's certain tiles that give you the first uh, the the first player or the the player with the most um, rain droplets there will get these wheat tokens. And then at the end of the game, whoever has the most wheat tokens gets 12 points, which is a lot of points in this game. And um, anyway, during the game, you have you have a deck of these action cards. There are four actions. Um, so they're kind of like, they look like suits on these cards. There's frost, sun, wind, and rain. And all of the actions are very straightforward. Like, the frost action lets you add a new cloud to the board with one of your droplets in it. And the, you know, I think the sun action lets you add more droplets into a cloud that you already have droplets in. And the wind action lets you move a cloud to an adjacent field. And if you move a cloud into another cloud, those clouds merge and all the water droplets um, combine into one and it becomes a thunder cloud. And, so the cool the cool thing about this game, especially with the like the collector's edition, is you have these clouds that are on these plastic standees, so they're elevated from the um, the tiles. Because I think the base That's game, cool. it's yeah, the, the base game is still cool. You get these like cardboard t- um, clouds, but it's cooler seeing the clouds in the sky with these like pretty beads uh, of of the droplets. But you, yeah, these actions are very simple. And when you take an action, so you're playing a card, um, you either will, you will need to also vote on what kind of weather we're going to have during the weather phase. And so if I take the sun action, for example, I can either vote on sun action or whichever the action is that's um, to the right of it clockwise. Um, so, and voting means I'm putting a disc. I mean, we all have these little wooden discs on that type of weather. Which, again, at the end, well, not again, because I haven't said it yet, but (laughs) after all the players take their actions, we're going to resolve weather based on whichever two types of weather have the most discs. And there's also a bonus if you have the most of your discs there, uh, which is really cool. So there's like a lot of a lot of different area majority kind of considerations as you're playing. And the other thing you could do is in the middle of the scoreboard, um, there's a board that has the score track and also um, these weather spaces where you're voting. Um, but in the middle of the board, there's dice. You have three dice, which you roll at the beginning of the game. And they have a certain amount of these little things. We we're calling them hamburgers, but they almost look like coins. And if you don't want to vote, the other thing you could do is tick down the value of one of these dice and eventually when it goes to zero, it shows as a harvest icon. And when all three dice, harvest dice, show the harvest icon, at the end of that round, there will be a harvest phase, which is a scoring thing. So the players are also manipulating the timing of when scoring happens. All of the field tiles have a certain amount of water droplets it needs on it, not in the clouds, but like on it. So you need to have it rain down for it to even be growing so that it will score. So there's like there's all this like really cool manipulation you can do. You also can since you can like with a wind action move a cloud that has at least one of your droplets in it. Other players' droplets might be in it. So you might strategically mm-hmm. move a cloud somewhere to, you know, hurt <laughs> hurt your opponents a little bit. So there's there's a lot of interaction, a lot of neat things you can do. Um, and then at the end of the round, after you, after everybody put passes from playing action cards, again, there's this weather phase and depending on the two types of weather that had the most votes, then there are weather effects. And like one of the weather effects might be like in reverse turn order, I think move one of your droplets to an adjacent space, you know, or add or double the amount of droplets you have in a cloud. And then if the the rain weather effect is any of those storm clouds um, that you have, I think thunder clouds, um, will rain. So that means they will dump onto the field and that might trigger it to be growing, in which case if we're doing a harvest, then it will score. So there's all sorts of really interesting um, player interaction for something that has very simple actions. It's very, very thinky. 
Um, yeah, my partner Matt like was, yeah, he was like, this feels like four way chess or something. You know, <laughs> there's, there's a lot to think about as you're setting yourself up to, you know, be winning certain fields, but also manipulating which weather effects are going to trigger and also trying to win majorities on the weather, the voting, because then you bump up on this track, which the further you get up this track, the more end game scoring points you get. So there's like all sorts of things you're kind of competing over. And again, like to me, this theme is just really cool, like where you're manipulating clouds and weather to make fields grow, you know? Yeah. So yeah, so that that is Petrichor. Have you ever heard of that or played that I've one before? I've never heard of it. It <laughs> yeah, sounds like a very unique theme though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it is kind of uh, a bit of a hidden gem. Like I don't know how many people know about like Mighty Boards. But um, yeah, it, it's definitely worth checking out, though, if you like area majority scoring games that have um, a lot of player interaction. And, um, and now I'm curious, they have a bunch of little mini expansions for it, like mm. cows and bees and flowers and stuff. <laughs> so I'm kind of curious to see what they all add to the game and uh, try those out. But yeah, that is Petricor. What's Very your next cool. game, Corey? My second game is an old one from 1986. Um, and this is Blood Bowl by Games Workshop, uh, designed by Jervis oh. Johnson. Uh, this is a two-player game. And I know nowadays there may be a lot more games that use this theme. But I would argue that, like, at the time, it was a very unique theme to be basically playing American football with a bunch of fantasy creatures like orcs <laughs> and goblins and elves and all that crazy stuff. Sure, sure. Um, so, I mean, I'll be honest. I, I've only played this game a few times, and it was years and years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, it was from the 80s. The games that are designed today are very different than these types of games. But uh, <laughs> on theme alone, like, I absolutely love, like, how, like, crazy and zany this is. Like, they really lean into, like, the fact that, like, anything can happen. And, That's cool. like... It's it's so bizarre. Um, I think one of the things that to me is one of the most enjoyable parts of the game is that the way that a lot of people play this is they'll play a season where everyone has their own team. And throughout the course of the season, you can have players to get injured. They can't play in the next game. Or you might hire some... Uh, some free agents to get onto your team and they might just stick around for a little while. And so the fact that this is one of those games that you can play over the course of many games and get That's kind cool. of that grand story of like winning the Super Bowl with your team after <laughs> all the injuries and brilliant plays that you went through. I think that's the main thing that really draws me and excites me about it beyond the fact that it's just zany and wacky and, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds kind of uh almost similar to what they did with Savage Bowl, you know, with trick taking. Yeah. But I I feel like I could picture the logo for Blood Bowl. Um but what was like like what did it look like? Like what was the like are you moving minis down a football field yeah. or was it So it's definitely a games workshop games. You had like little minis that you have to assemble and paint and there was a giant grid that was the field that you were moving along and there was a lot of dice rolling for passing and running and i mean crazy stuff could happen you could just like be running down the field and like trip over your own feet and drop the ball because you had a <laughs> terrible die roll and then the uh, other team will pick it up and it's like chaos in a board game um which honestly for the right people is perfect <laughs> cool so that's blood bowl Blood Bowl. Yeah, it sounds fun. And I do think that um, sports games are still a little rare. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that they fuse that with like fantasy creatures and stuff, it sounds wacky and fun. So I see why you picked it. <laughs> yeah. And I think throughout the years, we've seen lots of other people try to do that. And there are plenty of other games out there like it now. So. It was based on how original was it when it came out? And I would say got it. Original. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. <laughs> My next game is, uh, I think, 
I think still a super original game. I don't know if there are any games that are about building forts and making friends. And this is Fort, <laughs> which is a 2020 release uh, from Leader Games. It's designed by Grant Rodiak and uh, it plays with two to four players. And this is a deck building game where it's all about, again, building forts and you're making friends like your deck of cards are kid cards. And this is a re-implementation of uh, Grant's game called SPQF from 2018. Um, which was kind of about developing an ancient civilization, a, you know, an okay theme, but like this, I love this re-implementation. I think this is, hmm, I'm trying to think of like all the games that I know of that have been kind of re-implemented with new skins. And I think this is just one of the coolest re-themings I have uh, seen to date. Um, but your goal is kind of to have the most victory points. And again, you have cards in your deck that represent your friends. And each card has like this very fun thematic suit. Like there's squirt guns, uh, cards, skateboard cards, glues, books, I think. Um, and throughout the game, you're going to be playing cards and you're going to be building your deck, like kind of like you're getting new friends. And while you're doing this, you're collecting and spending resources, which in this game, resources our pizza and toys. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Like everything they did here thematically is, I just, it makes me smile. It's so well done. Um, but one of the things you're spending resources on is building your fort. So you have like five different levels you're trying to build up to, and you're trying to spend a certain amount of resources to advance, you know, to increase the level of your fort, the size of your fort. And that's one of the game ways the game can end is if one player gets their fort to level five. Um, that's one of the end game triggers. But when it's your turn and you play an action card, other players get the opportunity to follow, which I love that because there are a lot of deck building games, which could be kind of uh, sort of multiplayer solitaire. So now you have everyone at the table invested in what other people are doing. Um, and there are other reasons besides, um, you know, there are, a lot, there are a couple of reasons why it's good to follow in this game. And one is to play all the cards in your hand because at the end of your turn, any cards left in your hand are going to get dumped into the front of your player board in your tableau. And that is representing basically friends that you're not playing with. So they might leave you. You might get them back. But other <laughs> players, when you go to uh, recruit a card, um, get gain a new friend, like build your deck, you could either take a card from the face-up card market, which is the park, or you could take one from the park deck, or you can take one from one of your rival's tableaus. So I'm it's like, hey, now. if you're not playing with your friends, they might leave <laughs> you. Yeah. So there's like, there's some really interesting um, player interaction in this game that I thought I knew about uh, SPQF just like a month or two before I I knew they were doing Fort. And I was like, this is so cool because I like deck building and I like, you know, unique twists on anything. And so I always thought it was such a cool mechanic and I'm glad they, you know, leader picked it up and they, they added this new theme to it. So it's getting, you know, getting out there to more people um, cause it's, it's, it's really fun. And it also like, I got a comment on the awesome playful art that Kyle Farron mm -hmm. did, you know, who does the art for root and I think every leader game. Um, but the whole package, like the components, the art, the, the verbiage on everything is so thematic. And, um, yeah, that's, that's Fort. Have you, uh, that's ever awesome. played that one or no, um, that's a great pick, though. If I had thought of it, I would have put it on my list. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah, I've, I've met Grant before a few times and at Gen Con. He's a great guy. Um, and the uh, I remember when this game was announced and it was another one of those ones like when you're talking about quirky circuits. I'm like, ooh, that looks really <laughs> interesting. And I yeah, I, I like deck building games, but I um, so many of them feel very similar but this one yeah. felt like it had not just a cool theme and a cool personality, but it also had a lot of really unique mechanics that I love. Um, yeah. So yeah. it is now on my wish to playlist. Love it. Love it. I hope you enjoy it because I think, I think it's super fun. 
Um, and again, I think the the unique theme is very well integrated. And I know they they have an expansion for it. I think it's like a dogs and cats mm. expansion. I haven't I haven't picked that up yet or tried that. Uh, but yeah, if if you like deck building games and just or games with unique themes, definitely recommend checking out Fort. The other positive is it's a small box. It does not take up that much space on your shelf. Yep. <laughs> uh, cool, cool, cool. Well, what is your next game? So my next game is actually a single player board game. It's called Hostage Negotiator. And this yes. is a game by Van Ryder Games. Uh, Released in 2015, designed by AG, sorry, AJ Porfir- Porfirio, I believe that's how you pronounce it. Okay. Um, and in this game, so it's a solo game, and you take on the role of a hostage negotiator. You've trained your whole life to be put in these high-pressure situations where when some criminal takes hostages, you're there on the phone trying to talk them off and get the hostages free without things going south. Um, so the theme can be a little bit dark for some people, right? Um, like you're trying to free all the hostages, but there's a chance that some of them might die and not make it out. Um, but the mechanics for it are pretty simple. There's a board in front of you that has a few tracks on it. One of them is like the, the, the tension, whereas the um, person who took the hostages as they get more irritated, like this track accelerates and they get more irrational. Um, and then you've got another track for conversation points where you can gain these points um, by talking to them to try to buy better cards to use on future turns. Um, and ultimately your goal is you're trying to free at least half of the hostages and capture or eliminate um, the uh, person who's captured them. And there is, uh, a bunch of different characters that you can choose from that you're playing against. Um, and each of them has their own personality. They've got their own demands that they want you to fulfill. Um, and you can choose to fulfill these things for them or not. We don't negotiate with hostages. Like you can get really <laughs> into it um, as you're playing it. You can get a lot off the theme. There's great flavor text on all the cards. Like it, they show like little voice bubbles of what you're like yeah, saying yeah. to him, but you can also role play it. Um, there's a lot of dice rolling and and there's a lot of randomness involved, but it's a very strong theme and it's very unique. I can't believe I did not have this on my list. Uh, I totally forgot about Hostage Negotiator, okay. but I played it. I So this is, you mentioned the theme being kind of like dark or, you know, not everybody might be into it. And I was very turned off by the theme. I'm like, Mm. I don't want to play this. Like, this is not something I envision myself enjoying. And I don't remember if I just had seen uh, Liz Davidson's like Beyond Solitaire channel where she always enjoyed it. And I think she has some videos on it. And I, there were just at some point I was like, I'm going to give this a shot. And I got it. And I just loved it. It's just, it's so well done thematically Mm-hmm. And I ended up going nuts and I bought all of it. And I <laughs> like I, I heard that the career expansion is supposed to be awesome. Have not tried it yet, but I still own it. And this is like one of those games I refuse to sell because I know it's like so good. And everybody I, I know who's played it says that that expansion, like that career mode or whatever, kind okay. of like elevates it. So, and I, again, I bought all of the different like criminals or or hostage, you know, all the different packs. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I just, I have not had a chance to kind of revisit it, but I can't believe I totally forgot about that game. (laughs) Oh, that's a great pick. Thanks. (laughs) Hostage Negotiator. Cool, cool, cool. Um, The next game on my list um, is actually designed by a friend of mine um, here in the LA area. And it is a game that came out in 2022, and it is on a very unique historical topic. And this game is called Stonewall Uprising. It's designed by Taylor Shuss, and it's from Catastrophe Games. It plays with one to two players, um, but it you know it was definitely designed as a two player experience um, because it's kind of a there's a tug of war situation. Um, but this is another unique deck building game. 
and uh, with a unique theme. And it's about the Stonewall riots that took place in June of 1969. Um, and there were the, there were a series of protests in response to a police raid at the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village, which is in like lower Manhattan. And this was pretty much like a pivotal event that transformed the gay liberation movement in the 60s through the 80s and 20th century fight for LGBT rights in the U.S. So it's like... It was a very pivotal moment in history, and the way the game approaches it is it's a two-player asymmetric deck-building game that's kind of fused with some CDG or card-driven game mechanisms where you're either going to play as the pride or the man fighting for or against equal rights. And um, what you're doing is you'll have a deck of cards, and the the decks are asymmetric, um, as you would expect, And you're playing cards to move on three different tracks. And, you know, picture tracks that, again, there's like a tug of war aspect to this where there are three tracks and then there's a little cube in the middle of each track. And whichever uh, side you're playing as on for the game, you are trying to push these cubes in the direction of your side to help you accomplish your goals the three tracks, one of them represents uh, systemic support, the other public opinion, and another one is individual support. And um, one of the cool things is when you get to the end of the tracks, if you're able to get to the end of the tracks, you get some immediate benefit, but then it resets back to the middle of the track. Mm. So there's going to be constantly this uh, this push and pull. And any kind of games that are tug of war style, you know, there's a lot of like tension with your opponent because... And just like with your decision process, because you might want to do one thing, but if your opponent starts pushing something too far in their directions, like you have to kind of respond to that too. So you're kind of like juggling those things. Um, But in the game, the pride's goal is to shift the Overton window and to organize protests and demonstrations and sit-ins to pretty much convince the public um, that it's socially accepted, like what they're trying to do. And um, the man's goal is to try to detain and demoralize 10 people from the Pride's deck um, to pretty much kind of like fizzle out the Pride's movement. So um, on your turn, uh, you you can play a card. And again, like each card has one of the, the track suits, uh, like, you know, blue, green, and red, I believe, are the colors that are associated with the tracks. So if I play like a three red card, I'm going to push the the red track three spaces, the cube three spaces in my direction. And um, the cards in your deck, they're all they all represent like real historical people and organizations and events that occurred like in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So there was a lot of research that Taylor did. And I think that um, well, one of the other things I like mechanism wise is that like at some point, one of you is going to fold, meaning you're going to stop playing cards for the round. When you fold, if you're the first to fold, you are going to, first of all, pick one of the tracks and push the cube in your opponent's direction. Hmm. And then every card that your opponent plays after that, the value is doubled, which sounds like, well, why would I want to fold first? But every card that they play you will get to draw an additional card in the next round. So okay. you're kind of like setting yourself up for an advantage. And it's like, and then for your opponent, for the person who is second to fold, it's like, how much did they want to like do that? Like that's juicy to mm-hmm. be able to double the value of your cards, but you're also giving your opponent a good head start on the next round, um, which I thought was a, a, like a really interesting kind of twist on a two player deck building game. Um, But not only is it like a fantastic, intense two-player game, but it's such an important historical topic to to understand more about. And I'm really glad that Taylor created this game um, because it was inspired by his own personal experiences as a gay man in the U.S. And I know, again, he put a lot of tons of research into it. And like, hopefully anybody who plays it can like learn a little bit more about this, like, just pivotal event in history, you know? And I don't think there are any um, 
games on gay civil rights, you know? So like, to me, this, like this theme is so unique. And again, the gameplay, like Taylor, just as a designer is, has a very unique style. And I have, cause I'm friends with him. Like we've play tested each other's games and stuff like that. So I, I always love seeing what he comes up with. And I'm just really glad that this game exists and I'm looking forward yeah. to seeing like whatever he kind of does next. That's awesome. That's a great pick. Yeah. Have you, uh, had you heard of that one? I, I might've heard of the game in passing. Um, like the historical event, honestly, up until a few years ago, I, I wasn't even aware of it. And so right. just like the visibility of telling people more about it, I think is great. And the fact that it's got a good game behind it, like win, win. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a small publishing company, uh, catastrophe games. I think they kind of do, uh, more the print on demand kind of, okay. um, but yeah, it's definitely like I I just love historical games in general because it's you're right. Like I didn't know anything about Stonewall Uprising, but it's like now I have this game to kind of explore the the struggles um, from both perspectives, you know, and <sighs> yeah, and just like learn more about this history. So and it has mm-hmm. a solo mode as well, um, which where you'll the solo mode you play as the pride against the man. Um, sure. But yeah, that is Stonewall Uprising. Very cool. My next game um, was a game that I saw this year at Gen Con called Sky Team. Yes. uh, (laughs) This game is designed by Luke Redmond, uh, published by La Scorpion Mask. It's a two-player game. And I'm going to be honest, I put it on my list because my coworker won't stop talking about how awesome this game is. I agree. We were, we were at Gen Con and we're sitting at the booth. We're waiting to like demo it. And it was a really long wait. And we said, oh, we'll come back later. And then there was a line to purchase it. And he got in line and I didn't. And now I regret it. And so oh. he's been playing it and I haven't been. And he just beat the whole uh, the whole campaign. And he's like, oh, oh man, cool. so good. Um, but for those who don't know what Sky Team is, it, it's a two-player game. Um, with limited communication, you've got the pilot and you've got the co-pilot. You're working together to try to land a plane. Um, and you're doing this by rolling dice and by assigning dice to this board in front of you that will affect different things about the plane, such as your speed, your angle. Um, and there's a million different ways that you could crash and explode and not land. Um, and each um, the game starts out with like a, a, a simple... Um, airport and job for you to do and as you kind of play through the game you play more complex missions where they introduce new mechanics and new things that you have to worry about Um, and being a limited communication game there's a lot of like oh man why did you do that and sometimes you don't have a choice Um, it's I I generally like those sorts of games I know you're talking about the limited communication for uh, yeah quirky circuits um but uh, I, I really look forward to finally playing this game eventually. Um, but just on theme alone, it, it had to be on this list. Yeah, awesome pick. I actually don't know why I didn't have it on my list, but maybe because I subconsciously just knew that you were going to put it yeah. on your list. But yeah, I did get an opportunity to demo it at, uh, at Gen Con, and I loved it. I my friend uh, Tim was ordering the game for himself and he ordered a copy for me. So I do, (laughs) I am getting, I am getting a copy because I wasn't able to get one at Gen Con. And that was like one of my regrets of not leaving there with a copy of Sky Team. I also think (laughs) one day I'm going to have to have trivia for the podcast, but I think, so that might've been the fourth or fifth time that sky team came up on this podcast. Oh yeah. And that just, yeah, that, but that just goes to show you that like a lot of people are enjoying it and it is like a really unique theme and it's, it's (laughs) really well integrated. And again, like, yeah, I love this limited communication cooperative games are just my jam apparently. Uh, Mm -hmm. Cause I'm a, I'm a big fan of it already. And I, I've only played that first scenario, but I just, you know, I saw uh, what some of the other scenarios had to offer, and I'm like, oh, I gotta, I gotta play more of this. 
Uh, right. So I hope you get to play it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I will eventually. Um, I, I just can't think of any other games that are about your pilots landing a plane. So yeah. <laughs> that's great. Whoever thought awesome. of that, genius. <laughs> that's Scott's All right. Cool. And I, I got a, a, a interesting one coming at you now. So um, this is a solo game. It came out in 2022. And when you mentioned you were a solo game, I was kind of wondering if it was going to be this. <laughs> but this one uh, might be a bit of a deep cut because it's from Holland Spiel. And it is called Heading Forward. It's mm-hmm. a game designed by John Dubois. And again, it's a solo game where you're going to be taking on the role as someone who's going through rehab after a like major brain injury. And it's actually based on the designer's like our, a real recovery experience that he had. And he wow. made this game based on that, which is incredible. Um, but to win the game, you basically have to relearn and develop skills and kind of like achieve these goals in three out of four different areas, but you only have a certain amount of time that your insurance company has given you because yeah, right. Exactly. Otherwise they're going to stop paying for your rehab sessions and you lose the game. So, um, the, the game board for this, um, it's mostly cards that you're playing with, but you have this calendar um, and on the calendar, that's kind of your round ticker. Like you have these red numbers on certain days of the calendar and, um, you have a deck of cards and every time you cycle your deck, the round timer is ticking down. And so you can play it on, I think it was three different difficulty levels. Uh, for whatever reason, I decided to start on medium instead of just trying easy. And I probably <laughs> st- should have started on easy, even though I felt like I was going to be able to win this. But it's basically like a hand management and resource management game where uh, you have a deck of cards that have, again, there are four different types of skills. Um, So like four different suits. And each of these skills within the suits um, have four stages. So there's a stage one. And then there's, you want to try to get that to ticked up to stage two, which when you tick a card up to stage two, two or just up a level you're going to rotate it so when you play a card on your turn cards always have a resource cost to play them and you have a couple different resources in the games one is on your cards that are in your deck um some of the cards will have one or two heart icons which represent care Um, or they'll have a little hourglass icon, one or two. I don't think any of them have more than that. Um, but that represents time. And so certain, certain cards, you know, that you play, you have to spend a certain amount of time. So you might need like to discard another card to play it. And then you also have, um, resource, a resource called spoons that are actually like there's cutouts of spoons, which I guess, um, I don't remember the person's name who came up with this idea of, spoon theory but i think it's like representing um you as you're kind of recovering having like small chunks of energy that you're able to kind of work with so each um each turn you take um is pretty much playing a hand of cards till you can't and you can spend spoons but you always get your spoons back at the start of your next turn so you're and you're able to throughout the game gain more spoons, which you really need to do uh, to be successful at the game. So spoons are a resource, and then you also have money as a resource. But when you spend money, it's gone. So you have to keep trying to make money, and then you spend it. And then again, you have the cards. The other thing that you can get in the game is these. I'm just going to call them brains because there's like a brain <laughs> token. I think it's you like expanding the amount of capacity of things that your brain can tolerate. And okay. as you improve on that throughout the game, you have, that's on the, the main board, that's increasing your hand size, which is helpful because again, that's giving you resources yeah. and everything. Um, but so to, to level up a card, you have to spend resources and it usually gives you some benefit, but then to, I'm sorry, let me restate that. To play a card, you have to spend resources and it gives you some benefit when you do. Then to level it up, you may need to spend resources to kind of like level it up. 
Thankfully, all of the cards that are level one, you don't need to spend anything. to. They auto-rotate to level two if you're able to play it. So you rotate the card, and now you put it in your discard pile facing the opposite direction, uh, 180. And That's then cool. if after you cycle your deck, now if you're able to take that card from level two to three, you swap out the card, and you have cards off to the side that are um, mm-hmm. level three and level four on the other side. And they get increasingly, they give you cooler benefits, but they get harder to kind of like level up as you go. Mm-hmm. So... Um, The other thing is, in your deck, you have a trigger card. And this is, at the beginning of the game, you randomly pick one type of skill. I don't know, maybe it's driving or something. Uh, And you put that on the top left of the board. And every time you draw this trigger card, you have to play it. Um, So if it's in your hand, that's the first thing you need to play. And basically, it's it's reminding you of the trauma, which put you Mm -hmm. in this like situation. So it's like a setback. And you have to pretty much spend the resources that are on the current your trigger card, which also okay. can level up if you have to, if you can level it up, you have to. So that's getting more and more expensive every time as you're trying to level up these cards Ugh. in your hand, you're getting like triggered and everything. But again, you're playing through cards, you're trying to figure out which cards to try to level up because you're often, especially in the early game, not gonna have the resources you need to like level up all the cards your hand size starts as three so you're lucky if you're able to like level up one card and then you draw another set of cards reset your spoons and then oh maybe maybe now this is level two i get it to level three gives me some money gives me a new spoon so you're like kind of building up your engine one of the things that's interesting is as you increase your brain power which is super helpful you're able to draw more cards. So then you have like more resources in your hands, more cards that you can level up potentially if you spend your resources right. But then you're going through your deck faster because the size of your deck does not change the whole game. You are swapping out cards, you know, so you're Mm -hmm. always having the same size deck. And the sooner you cycle your deck, the faster the game is like the end is coming. So it's Mm -hmm. like, it's it's a catch twenty two, you know. It's like <laughs> ah, like I want more cards so I can do more stuff, but I don't want the game to speed up because I need more time to yeah. you know get these skills. So anyway, this it, it, I thought this game was really really cool. Um, I had been wanting to play it for a while. I've had it for a while, and I actually played it just recently um, in preparation for this podcast because I've always thought the the theme of it was really really unique. Um, and I like I like playing solo games. And um, yeah, this is, it's called Heading Forward. I found it to be like really puzzly and challenging. And again, like the fact that this was designed based on this designer's like real recovery experience is just like mind blowing to me, you know? Yeah, no, that's really fascinating. I I can't remember if I heard of this one or not, um, but it definitely makes me want to check it out, research it more. Yeah, and if you if you p- like playing solo games, I mean, if you're playing Hostage Negotiator, um, it's definitely worth playing and checking out. And I'm already, from losing that first game, I'm already like, oh, I can't wait to try it again and see if I can play it smarter. Um, mm-hmm. But it's like you, you feel the struggles, like you feel the financial struggles because like there are certain cards to tick up because I need to complete four of these skills to win the game, four different skills. So I can't mm-hmm. just focus on one thing and and that's it. No, if I have a green skill, I need a pink skill and a blue skill or a brown skill, you know. So it's it's very challenging. But um, yeah, that is heading forward. Very cool. Thanks. My last pick um, is a game from 2001. Ooh. And it's called X-Bugs. Um, this was designed by Marco Maggi and Francesco Nepatello. Um, published by Nexus Games in the U.S. It was uh, distributed by Steve Jackson Games back in the day. Um, so it's a it's a two to four player game. Uh, the The original box just came with like two players, but you could get more expansions to play with more people. And it's a dexterity game where each player plays a different faction of bugs. And these <laughs> bugs are like everything from like these are the USA bugs, which are like American soldiers from World War II and guys with like Marines and oh, wow. tanks and different <laughs> stuff. 
So there's like the USA bugs, and then there's like these cyborg bumblebees, and then there's like these weird like alien esque bugs, and there's it's all sorts of crazy, crazy stuff. The theme is <laughs> is nuts. Um, but yeah, you're these little insects, and everybody has an army, um, and they come on these little tiddlywinks. So they're little plastic discs. They've got a sticker on each side. Sometimes they will have a different ability on the flip side of them. Like there'll be some bugs that on one side, they've got a force field around them that they're protected when they're flipped on that side. Um, and at the start of the game, everyone sets up their base, which is they've got three buildings that they put down, um, which are these larger discs. And then you put out your army, which is all of your other discs. And they come in various sizes. You've got like small ones, big circles, long rectangles. Um, and so you, you array your army, however you want. And then the other player does the same thing. And then you take turns rolling dice and on your turn, you roll your dice. It's going to, um, each die is going to show a symbol of what type of insect you'll be able to move that turn. Like if I'm playing the, um, the bees, I might get my drone that I can move and one of my warriors or whatever. And so you look at your dice that you rolled and then you've got a little flicking stick that you used to actually like push down on yeah. your tiddly wink and it flips into the air. Um, <laughs> your goal is that you're trying to destroy the other player's base. They've got those three buildings in front of them. You need to destroy either all three or two of the three. It, it depends upon what addition you have. Um, but the other thing that you're doing is that in the center of the board, there are a bunch of resources, which are just these crystals that you kind of randomly drop at the start of the game. And if you land on one of those, you collect the resource and you save up enough resources, you can upgrade your bases, which give you new special abilities. Oh, cool. Um, so each of your bugs have different powers. Your bases eventually get different powers. And um, they added more to it. They uh, eventually re-released it as Micro Mutants, um, which was uh, FFG actually did the, the English um, printing of that. Um, but they added like extra cards and different things that you could buy. Um, but I remember when I first played that game and like my mind was blown because <laughs> yeah, first of all, the theme's crazy, but I played a lot of the Starcraft video game back in the day. The original Starcraft loved it, played it multiplayer with like my brother and my friends. Um, and when I played X bugs, I thought like this is the closest I've ever felt to playing the StarCraft video game um, to a tabletop game that I've ever experienced. Oh, wow. Um, and I can understand why people, some people might be turned off from like the dexterity element. It's not for everybody. I personally like dexterity games. Um, but just the fact that like you've got uh, drones that you're sending out to collect resources, to upgrade your base, to get special powers, all your guys kind of function differently. Um, I might be trying to like flip one of my green berets so that he lands on his camouflage side so that you can't attack him. And he's like sitting right next to your base. Um, or there are some uh, enemies that can actually fire projectiles. There's like a, a tank that the U S team has. Sorry. It's not a tank. What is it? I don't know. It can fire. It's a rocket launcher guy. He's got a rocket launcher. Gotcha. You can place a little rocket next to him. So he can stand still and he can like fire his rockets across the board and try to hit other people. Um, it's, it's a silly little game. It's been out of print for years. It's probably pretty hard to find, but it remains in like my top favorite games of all time, uh, for the gameplay. And because the theme is just so wacky. <laughs> That's Have you ever cool. It? No. So I have not, I've never even heard of that, but it sounds really wacky. And, uh, I I have very limited experience with um, dexterity games. Like I've played pitch card before. Mm -hmm. um, enjoy that. I played. Um, I'm not going to be able to think of the name of it. It came out maybe like four or five years ago. Catacombs. I played oh, yeah. Catacombs. Yeah. And um, I guess Crokinole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, I love Crokinole, but. Uh, that game sounds really, really unique and interesting. And I don't think while I while I don't think like dexterity games are like my oh, I can't wait to try them all. Um, 
I that sounds fun. <laughs> it sounds fun and really, really unique. Uh, and it's funny that you it has like a bug theme that's also like kind of a war game thing. <laughs> yeah, it's super weird. So yeah, I got really into it when it first came out, and this was before I was working in the industry or anything. Um, and they had two different sets um that was like this army versus this army and i bought both of them so i had all four armies so i could play four players and then they released uh, a third set but it never came to the u.s and so i actually like imported it from italy um and i couldn't <laughs> nice. find the rules for it anywhere and i i posted on board game geek if anybody had the rules and the designer actually reached out to me and he sent me the rules so oh, awesome. that was pretty awesome i still have it <laughs> never gonna lose that that's that is awesome, and it was called X X Bugs X Bugs X Bugs. Later republished as Micro Mutants. It's funny because one of the games I when I was making my list of games I was considering was a uh, uh, Bug Council of Backyardia, another bug game. Oh. It is a uh, it's this uh, trick taking game that fuses like trick taking with a Mancala mechanism. Okay, uh, but yeah, yeah. but it's all bug related, and I I. Love how the designer or whoever wrote the the quote unquote lore for it. There's just so much humor in the rule book uh, related to these different bug factions and everything that I saw. I thought was really cute. And I'm I'm somebody who cannot stand bugs, but <laughs> somehow in games it's working for me. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um. All right. Cool. Well, my last game is. Always the first game I think of when I think of unique themed board games. Okay. And uh, I actually, this is, this will be kind of funny. I actually owned this game, uh, only played it once, loved it, loved it, uh, you know, thought it was great, but I just like, I, I have too many games and I don't have enough space at, or time in a lifetime to play them all. So I ended up selling it a couple of years ago and literally this morning I ended up just buying it again. <laughs> Someone was selling it on the geek market and I was like, Hey, I would like to buy that. <laughs> so, uh, that game is Castell. Castell is a game that came out in 2018, uh, designed by Aaron Vanderbeek. Um, and it was the English edition was published by Renegade game studios and it plays with two to four players and it is a game about building human towers and competing at festivals in catalonia oh, yeah. so this was something that i don't think i even knew before this game was a thing um but i definitely youtubed it after i discovered the game <laughs> and it is wild so there's a whole you know in spain there are at these festivals there are people making these impressive human towers and they're just it's it is wild i just encourage anybody to like go ahead and do some research on that yeah. but someone here aaron made a board game about this and in the game you're basically running a castell team and you're traveling around different regions of catalonia and um i think there are only like four actions in the game like you can move to different regions on the map and then you can recruit castellers for the team. I think you start with a certain amount. And these castellers are like rectangular tiles um, that have a person on them. And it'll have a, um, a size. So, and yeah, the castellers each have a size. I think it ranges from like 10 being the largest to maybe a one. Okay. And when you're making these towers, they basically, like the the core rule is that the bottom row has to uh well first of all every row has to only have the same size castellers mm. the bottom row has to have the the uh largest size and then each row that goes up has to be smaller than the one below it mm -hmm. um and also cannot be wider it has to be less people so think of like mm. a pyramid literally yeah. a pyramid but throughout the game, one of the things you can do is you can you can uh, improve your skills. You can train in different areas, which will let you kind of break those rules to be able to do things like 
I don't know, like have two different size Castellers on a row or let your the width of your Castell go beyond three and stuff like Mm. that. So on the game board, there's like the map of the different regions, but then there's also this skill wheel where it's you have different skills around the wheel. I think there were tiles, if I recall. And then in the middle, you have, it's like a wheel of fortune color wheel that shows all the different locations and each round it's going to rotate. So maybe in um, uh, Barcelona, I don't know, uh, in one region this round, you can go there and train in strength. And, sure. um, and I think the strength training lets you have people on the a level above that are the same size. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, like this, this training you're doing is breaking rules. But you're doing all of this because you're competing at festivals. So at the top of the board, um, you will randomly place out these tiles showing where festivals are going to be each round. And in order to compete in the festival, you need to be there when it's time for the festival to happen. And so you know at the beginning of the game where different festivals are happening. And the way the festivals score, if I recall... Um, is you'll make a pyramid. So this is like a very puzzly game, um, but mm-hmm. you'll make a pyramid with your different Castellers that you have, you know, following whatever training you have and the, the core rules of building the, your, your tower. And each tile in it, I think, gives you a point. And then each, uh, the other thing that goes out randomly at the start of the game under each location for the festival is a certain number, meaning um, representing the size of the Castellers. So if there's a seven in one region and you're scoring that festival, every seven Casteller you put into your pyramid is going to give you an extra point. And the more players that are also competing at the same festival as you, the juicier the rewards you get um, for scoring scoring the actual festival. So a lot of what you're doing is trying to recruit and train to set yourself up for scoring these festivals – But then they also have like there's a special action where you could do these local performances, which are almost like fulfilling contracts like you can do um, as a special action. You can fulfill like it might have a certain shape requirement for a um, a a tower. And it's like, oh, if you have that, you can say I performed at that local performance. And I think that gives you some points or something, too. Uh, But, yeah, it's just it's. I again, I was thinking about it as I was kind of preparing to talk about it on here, and I was like, "Ah, I want to play that game again. It's so cool." <laughs> so I had to, I had to rebuy it. I had to rebuy it, and I'm very excited to kind of revisit it uh, because again, the, the theme is just unbelievably unique, and it's yeah. again something I didn't know anything about. I don't think I ever knew this existed before this game. And it's so impressive when you see, you know, the real life people making Uh these towers and they know how to like they know how to if somebody's going to drop when it's dropping down to like do it safely and gracefully and everything. And uh, yeah, yeah. Have you I'm assuming you haven't heard of this one. When you mentioned the name at first, I was like, I'm not sure if I remember that. And then when you start describing the human <laughs> towers, I'm like, yes, I have seen that. I've not played it, but I definitely remember seeing um, seeing that game when it came out. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's it's very, again, it's like one of those games are like there are four actions you can take, you know, similar to Petrocore. But there's a lot of thinkiness and like the, trying to position yourself to be in certain regions to train or to recruit certain people, but maybe you want to be in a region to be there for the festival. So you're kind of, you have to strategize a bit um, and you can't ignore what other players are doing. Uh, so anyway, yeah, Castell is like, anytime I think about a unique theme game, I'm like, there's a game about making human pyramids. That's wild. So that's yeah. that is my my uh, number one pick, and again, yeah, I, I it's one of the most unique themed games I have uh, ever played. I did have a couple of honorable mentions that I'll just shout out. Yeah. Um. Uh. One is uh another game that's been brought up on this podcast a lot from just different people who are excited about it, but it's Votes for Women. Um. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a card driven game about the American suffrage movement. 
the American women's suffrage movement. There we go. <laughs> um, and there's a game uh, that was one of the Zenobia Award finalists called Molly House uh, that's going to be published by Whirligig Games. Um, that's Cole and Drew Whirly's uh, label. Label. I'm back. I'm thinking back in my music days. Um, mm -hmm. Publishing company. And it's about the queer community in 1720s London. I actually played a prototype of it at Gen Con and it's, I'm really excited about this game. Not only the unique theme, but um, you know, anything that, uh, and it's designed by Joe Kelly, but you know, anything that Cole has uh, his hands on is going to be like unique and interesting. So um, I'm excited about that. And then there's the cost which is uh, was a Spielworks game uh, it, that's about the economics of the asbestos industry. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. That one's kind of crazy. An infamous traffic uh, where you're creating supply chains to um, conduct opium trade in, uh, in China in the 19th century. Cerebria, which is like inside out where you're controlling the emotions in a human brain. Um, yeah, well, uh, we did a game like that with, uh, I don't know if you heard of Voices in My Head that we did at Unexpected Games. I actually have heard of it. I've never played okay. it. And someone, when I was brainstorming games, someone I talked about when I mentioned this topic brought that game up and I, ha I hadn't, I haven't played it before. Yeah, it's basically a, a man is on trial for robbing a bank um, and everyone plays the competing emotions inside him. So one That's person cool. might be the sense of honesty that just wants him to tell the truth while he's on the stand. Somebody else might be um, the uh, fear of not wanting to go to prison. And so we each have a hidden role. And then the action of the trial happens where each turn a card is drawn and some event happens in the courtroom. Maybe he's on the stand and asked a question like, where were you on the day of the bank robbery? And whoever controls the speech portion of his brain will get to answer that question, which will affect the jury. Oh, um, wow. And so you're That's kind of competing over these different areas of his brain to control like his motor functions, his speech, his hearing, his sight. Um, and all of this you can use to kind of influence the trial and influence the jurors. It's totally weird. But yeah, I, I love so. it. I love it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to try it. Also, like speaking of trial, like one of the games I have not played yet is called High Treason. And it's a okay. two player, like kind of card driven game based on the trial of what, Louis Rial. Um, I don't remember exactly what happened. And like this is a game that I picked up a while ago and still haven't tried. I had hoped to get it to the table before recording this. <laughs> um, but that's another like, again, like these courtroom games and your game, it sounds like it kind of fuses a little of that and i love that messing with the uh manipulating the emotions of someone and the mm -hmm. way they're thinking like that's such a a cool concept and then we were kind of talking about how sports games are a little rare there's like baseball yeah. highlights 2045 yeah X, yeah awesome deck building game if you like baseball <laughs> yeah and baseball, then but also like a little bit of sci-fi kind yeah, of yeah yeah exactly yeah. It, it makes it, it gives it an extra little twist to make it different um, and then the last one I had on my, uh, quick honorable mention list was, uh, tragedy looper. Um, yes. have you played that one before? I, I know of it. Okay. <laughs> it's a good one. I, I almost would have put that on my list if I had thought of it. Yeah, it was almost on my list, but, uh, I've only, I've only played it once and it was a while ago and I played the original version and I have since um, WizKids sent me the new version that they did. I, um, I forget, is it called New Loops or something? Tragedy Looper New Loops. But I haven't gotten a chance to play it yet. And that one is just like, it's uh, my friend Ben knows it well and loves it. And he's the one who like taught it to me and, and you know, showed it to me. And I was so fascinated about it because basically one player is... Um, like the protagonist or something. And then the mm -hmm. other players are trying to deduce something that happened. You're, you have all these different characters. Um, but there's like the, the protagonist player, the is, is kind of like, there's a whole script that's happening 
and you every time something happens when one of the characters die the the you loop back and you restart but you get some data and it's so weird and i can't even really explain it well <laughs> all i know is it's just like one of the most like fascinating games i've ever played and i want to um i want to play it more so I, yeah. i'll talk about that at a later date after i've played it more but it's just it is a very unique theme where you're like looping through these tragedies happening and you're trying to uh, figure something out. And there's one person who's like a mastermind kind of player. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, anyway, that's fascinating. Yeah. Did you have any honorable mentions you wanted to things that almost made the list? Um, yeah. I, when, when, uh, when you were talking about one of your games, it made me think of uh coma knots, which was a game by plaid hat games, which, um, it was one of their adventure book games okay. um, where you were a, there was a man who was in a coma. Um, and so you're kind of playing these adventures in his subconscious. And so you're like fighting against like elements within ah. his subconscious. It's very like um, supernatural. And there's all these sorts of crazy locations. Like you start at like his childhood home. Um, oh, wow. and you're like reenacting something, but then like there's dream sequences and all sorts of weird, crazy stuff that could happen. I only played it once, but it was totally, um, wow, wacky sounds... and, and cool. Um, yeah, that sounds very unique. Um, and it like also that reminds me of, and the same with heading forward, it reminds me of, uh, that game. Uh, do you remember what it was called? I think it was called Holding On. Um, and it was yeah. about someone mm -hmm. being in a coma. I never tried it, and I, Often I will see someone selling it on a flea market and I'm like, ah, I really want to try it, but I don't know when I would have time. So I haven't uh, ventured to try that, but that one is super unique too. Yeah. It, it was interesting because they came out about the same time, Coma Knots and Holding On. And I was like, oh, that's always <laughs> a shame. I feel bad for the designers because I've done the same thing before where I think I have a really unique idea and another game comes out like, right before right after it yeah like, it doesn't yeah. seem as unique anymore but it was <laughs> but it it's was cool. but it still was yeah. um awesome well Corey, it was great talking to you i'm glad we picked this topic i you know you're the games you picked uh i think all of them except a hot hostage negotiator were new to me and uh now i want to look them up and i know the the bug war game is long out of print but Hopefully I get a chance to try it sometime because that that just seemed like super wacky. And also I find dexterity games fun and that seems like, I don't know, it just sounded cool. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah, thanks thanks so much for joining me today. And it was great to talk to you. I'm a fan of your work and uh, I'm glad we got to chat a bit at uh, Gen Con as well. You've been listening to the Board Game Geek Podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at BoardGameGeek.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under Board Game Geek. You can reach us by email at podcast at BoardGameGeek.com. Thanks for listening.